So, so we're going to start out like how a case is open and then eventually gets on a bigger interaction in the workflow. Um, the commission gets about 1,600 to 1,800 complaints a year. Jamaican Health Day is a little bit off. And out of those complaints, uh, the weekly CMT authorizes about 25 to 30 percent. And you can kind of follow that up. So next we're going to talk about um, also during once the case is authorized at CMT, the staff attorney gets assigned, and the RCM, the Green Commission member, gets assigned. So we have a couple different paths you can take as far as discipline. The first one, statement of charges, is the most formal path that will <coughs> result in findings. Below that is statements of allegations. Those are informal, they're real findings. And That's about 80 percent of our work. When we say findings, it's like the commission hears a case and they find that respondents' practice was below the standard of care. And findings against someone is a big deal to the credentialers, courts, and even other states. Um, Conflicts with the sins, there are no findings, there are allegations. Respondent doesn't even have to admit or agree, but they do have to comply with the sanctions that are listed. We talk about failed stints, sometimes when the respondent doesn't accept them. Those could be escalated to an SOC, which could eventually result in a hearing, or they could be closed. So, next, yeah, so we talked about the stints are 80% of our work, the charges are about 20. Um, but staff attorneys drafting all of those. And for statements of charges, you get input from the AG and usually an expert witness. Yes.
Can I wait to respond or we can move into the default status? The default hearings are submitted this morning. That's when they don't respond, and we can present all evidence and the judge can make a ruling without the respondent being involved. So they do check all the boxes on the answer and it's proceeding on the hearing track. We resolve all, actually a lot of those cases with an agreed order, which is sort of similar to this did. Uh, the staff attorney drafts out assistance from the AG. And if, if that gets accepted, then the case is over. Um, one that has to do all the same things that are listed in the decree order. So, this is just a decision to me that uh, this is another way to look at the workflow. I'm not sure if that helps. Any questions on that? Yeah, we have another connector that says like rejected. Or it would be close if we don't even have enough such evidence. So now I think I'm ready to pass it over to the agents. So I'm Kristen Brower, and I moved here from Salt Lake City 15 years ago, and I've been doing cases for you for about 15 years. In Salt Lake City, I Directed the statewide office of attorneys, and we exclusively represented abuse and neglect of children. Um, and I've been an attorney for over 30 years now. Um, but I enjoy doing this work with you all, and um, I learned something about the doctors and expert witnesses that we work with, and it's always really interesting. And we do our best to try to present that to you. Um, it's challenging. As we are not physicians, so we rely on you all and to communicate that medical information to you through an expert witness. So, if you have questions, we're happy to talk about that process more. As you know, we can't talk about this um, until we know they're done. So, we know they're done when we lose. <laughs> if we prevail, we have to wait for the days to see if there's an appeal. There's an appeal sometimes years before we get to the degree for talking about this because it can be remanded back to the appellate courts. So, when we sound like the seem unwilling to talk about certain cases, it's because they're not really resolved yet. Um, but we can learn a lot from debriefing cases that are completely over, and sometimes we do that. Uh, and I'm Tracy Ball. I am also an assistant attorney general and also one of your prosecutors. And um, I, my background, Kristen is our civil litigation expert on our team. She's got the most experience in civil litigation. I come from a criminal prosecution background. I was a prosecutor at Kitsap County for a number of years, and then I worked in DC doing nonprofit work with private. So um, that's kind of my background is doing that side of things. Um, I've also been with the office of not quite in 15 years. Kristen's got a couple months on me there, um, but we have both been working for the medical patients since the time we started. Um, we both also do other cases. Um, I do most of the sexual misconduct that comes into our office, both from medical and from other professions, uh, because of my prosecution background, and that's just kind of my passion of life working with them. So um, Kristen does our hardest, most technical pieces, and I think that she probably could pass off medical school exams at this point based on what she has learned. But um, so, and I just have to say, it, it's really hard for me to be sitting here and not know very many of you because over the years I've gotten to know the commissioners, and with COVID um, and all the virtual stuff, we really haven't. And so it's really weird to be sitting here and seeing, you know, I mean, there's a handful of familiar faces, but Normally, we would know 80 to 90% of the commissioners um, 
for coming to meet us. I appreciate the opportunity very much. And you know what? I am going to scan and talk with this because I can't scan turning my back to the button. So I'll be going to go to the next slide. So one of the questions that comes up to us a lot is why do you need an expert in this case? The RCM is an expert. The RCM says what they did is, is wrong. It, it, you know, it's clearly violating the standard here. Why do we need to hire an expert? Well, the reason we have to do that is because when we do a trial, we're creating a record. If we win a hearing uh, with medical commission cases, I would say more than half of them appeal. And a higher court looking at that to see if the person got a fair trial is going to look at all the evidence. And if there's no expert on our side testifying about what was wrong with the care that was provided, then we aren't making a good record for them to look at and say, yeah, they got a fair hearing. What we're likely to see instead is the, the, the respondent's expert testified and we didn't put anything in because we were relying on the expertise of the panel. So we have to have an expert to testify about what was wrong. So also the panel members are not all experts in that field, you know, so it, it, they might need the expertise from the expert. And there's also a statute that says the good commission member is an expert, like basically in house, in, you know, inside council, they've been an in-house expert. The RCM cannot testify because it would be unfair. I mean, it's your colleague who you sit next to and, and you talk about um, cases all the time. And if they were to testify, you might put more weight on that simply because they're a fellow commissioner than you would another expert. So, um, so that's why we have to have experts. We love the expertise that you all bring, though. Um, you know, we do our best to craft questions to pull out the information and everything, but we are not doctors. And there are times when something will come up, and I, it's been some of my favorite moments in hearings when I have a panel member that will drill down on something that I had no idea was such a big deal and really nail the respondent on something. I'm like, you just said this, but I, I'm looking in your notes and on page, you know, whatever, you said this. and that doesn't sound like the, the, you know, what that would normally be. And all of a sudden, the respondent realizes they're, they're not just trying to fool lawyers, but they're trying to fool medical professionals, and it's not working. So we love it when you ask questions in here. We love it, love it, love it. Um, so you also can use your expertise in other ways you know, to determine whether you know, somebody's explanation for something sounds reasonable based on your experience in the medical field. Um, and also, if you make credibility findings in a hearing, those are not disturbed on appeal because you're the one observing the witness. So those are very important when you make credibility findings. Okay. It is important to say why you found one expert more credible than another. Um, I had a case remanded. I mean, it was really obvious that our expert was more credible, but the um, Superior Court judge who was at the hearing said, I don't know why you thought the commission's expert was more credible than the respondent. So we had to come back and get amended findings about why one expert was more credible than the other. And so we can save some of that time and expense if you articulate it the first time. It's because they're, you know, other things training, their thorough review. They said they had spent 100 hours with the documents, the respondents experts said it's spent an hour, or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. But there is a reason you think that um, that backs up that conclusion, and it's great to include that in the board. Um, yeah, so this just kind of, okay, the, you know, the, the way, the flow of things. So we're the prosecutors. We don't have to do, I mean, it's a weird kind of thing. We, we divide between staff attorneys and AAGs. We are working together on the case. We are all on the same team. We share information. You know, I will send reach out to the staff attorney. Are you close to settlement? Where do you think you are? You know, do you think this is likely to settle? Sometimes it'll be, I'm going to depose this witness. I'll let you know how they do, whether that you might want to soften your settlement position, you know, that kind of thing. So we have a lot of back and forth. But in the end, we are involved in the case until it gets into the litigation. And so then it kind of kicks into a high gear. It's kind of weird because a lot of times the case started a year ago. Something, you know, it was investigational, and then all of a sudden we're contacting witnesses and stuff. Um, 
but then we find, you know, the charges get filed, they're signed off on by both Melanie and by the AAG who's prosecuting the case. So we both reviewed it and said this case is good to go. Then it gets scheduled for a hearing. And then we are on very tight timelines on that. Once it gets set for a hearing, they try to hold the hearing within six months. Sounds like a long time, but in that time, we have to exchange witness lists, exhibit lists, conduct depositions, do any motions. You know, all the discovery is done, and then we have a hearing with you guys serving as our panel members. Unless it's a sex misconduct case, it gets transferred, then it, it's just a judge. But otherwise, you guys are our panel members, and that's what you're going to see. And I think that it's Kristen's time. Go to the next slide. I guess I get to do the shameless plug. But we need hearing We need commission members to sign up for hearings. We had in two cases, um, if we didn't have a hearing panel. And you look at the funnel and everything that happens, those cases that result in a hearing are ones you felt that strongly about, that we're not leaving, we're going to the mat audience. So then you really need a panel to hear that. And a panel has to be um, three commission members. Um, sometimes there's more, and that's um, nice. It's also sometimes advantageous to have four or five sign up in case somebody has an emergency, then you still have a full panel and can proceed because things happen to um, panel members just like everybody else. Um, and generally, if it's a standard of care case, there'll be at least two um, clinicians and a citizen member, a public member. Um, and in cases involving sexual misconduct, you have some special um, guidelines that you created around panel composition. Um, and so you want a public member participating and you want um, both sexes represented. And it's also really great to have panel members who have been through the training um, about smart training. And um, probably most of you have been through that. Um, helping you with um, sensitivity around those issues. Um, one of the things, both Tracy and I work a lot with victims in our prior job. Mine were child victims, Tracy's were adult domestic violence victims. We take these cases really seriously when patients have been harmed. And we try to run it like our own little special victim unit and our paralegals and, and us work really hard about teaching those people who form all the way along the process, doing a lot of hand holding, spending the time with them, um, helping decide how you testify. Do you need to testify? And we do the case without your testimony. Um, can we get a big term impact statement from you? I mean, we call them patients, but many of them are really victims in our cases. It's just that. Uh, Perpetrator happens to be a licensing. And I think I covered the rest of that. And once you sign up for hearing, there's some important rules um, about don't contact staff attorneys, prosecuting agents, opposing counsel, responding for them, help my judge directly. And so if you have questions, who can you go to? Um, during a hearing, those questions are for the judge. Um, if it's pre-hearing, then you will have other options about who to talk to. And if you're unsure, um, you can always ask, um, and people will redirect you if, if it wasn't you know, appropriate. Um, it's really important that um, if you had a question about logistics, those are going to go to the clerk's office and then to the to the judge. Um, don't do independent research on the case of the respond, right? You're like, oh, I'm going to Google that fire, but look up on the provider credential, like you normally would if you're the RCM and that stuff is handed to you. Um, but we don't do that. And in theory, you're really limited to the information that you receive as a panel member. Um, and then we know that's frustrating for you, especially on medical topics, because you're used to being able to just turn around and get on and up to date. That's why we try to provide an expert witness, and we often try to provide some of the literature um, on the topic that is from a um, 
reputable journal so that you'll have some of that information in your fingertips. Um, and then sometimes the materials will be sent to you in advance of the hearing um, with instructions about whether you can begin the review of those. Um, can you review them at lunch? Can you review the material between day two or three of the hearing? Um, those are all good questions for the health law judge presiding over the case. Question? Yes. Um, I wonder if you can provide the material. Hold on. You can't, you can't hear me. I'm all loudly. Thank you. I just wonder if my material only provided a day or two before the hearing. Sometimes I feel like I'm kind of just going crazy you know, going through, you know, a lot of material. The same for some kind of reading of high approach. That's a really good question. Um, we have talked about whether we would change that process of getting materials to the panel members more quickly, but it's not just our exhibits that should go to you. It, to be fair, with the other side's exhibits too. And then unfortunately, sometimes the way the hearing process works because of continuances and maybe somebody didn't get their exhibits in the right way, they weren't redacted, they weren't numbered. Um, we often don't have all with the health law judge and the clerk's office to send to you very far before the hearing. Um, we have talked about looking at that process and even setting an earlier cutoff date. We realize that sometimes you're sitting there with thousands of pages of medical records and maybe it's a one-day hearing, a two-day hearing, a five-day hearing, but it's still you know, a voluminous um, amount of material. We try really hard during the hearing to go through that material with our expert witness, pointing you to the key pages in the medical record because it's a lot of um, documents. We understand them. So question? Yeah. Dr. Curtis. Well, and three points out that civil juries don't get materials at that time. But you guys are used to being an RCM. You guys are used to your other hat. You kind of are used to looking at a whole file, and I get what it's frustrating to you. So in a hearing, if I get the records sent to me, can I assume I can look at them, or do I need to ask specifically for permission? Just take some lecture. Oh, I can speak to the, the original question as well. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, once they come to you, um, these have already been met by the judge and through the, um, the redaction process. So once you get that prepared, they're okay to look at it. I'll speak some more to your question about the mission and what it is. And have we generally communicated that clearly ahead of time? I think sometimes that question is where does the instruction come from and who gives it? You know? so, um, that's part of why we're doing this training to get the information heard by everybody at the same time, the same people. But I'm not sure that it's always um, communicated. Here's the materials, and you can start reviewing them now. Um, so it's good to have that. Is this a good time to ask an evidence question about what evidence or should I? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, I, as a panelist, I have been in a couple of hearings where I have assumed that the rules of evidence have um, have been modified in the same way that they are when we're in front of a panel. And um, I know that the general rule is that the evidence standard um, Supreme Court adopted evidentiary rules apply where nothing else conflicts, just like the civil rules do too. Um, but I can assume, so like in the panels, we are, we can look at um, prior complaints, and I mentioned this specifically about sexual misconduct. We can consider past complaints in the panel. I can assume that because that was a legislative modification, that we would also get to see prior sexual misconduct history at a panel. And so I'm wondering, and in fact, I've been on panels where I think we probably, I, I don't want to suggest that, is this 
this. Are we open or are we closed? Okay. It's an open meeting. So I think that there could be some confusion about assuming if you're in a hearing that if there had been prior misconduct that you would have heard about it. Now, in on the civil side. Issue and in fact, it's going to come up on my next slide because I thought it was really important <laughs> to cover it here. Um, but I'm just going to skip to it because we're on the topic right now. Um, so, when you are a reviewing commission member or the panel deciding whether a case should be charged, you get to know about prior complaints and prior discipline, and in fact, it's important to you in driving your decisions. Um, when you come to a hearing, you do not get to know that. Um, and so you shouldn't assume either way. But I think because you're used to seeing it in your other hat on the commission, you can you would, will possibly assume this is this respondent's first case. If there had been something else, I would know about it up front in this case. And you can't assume that. A couple um, Further things, when you get to a sanctions determination, so if you make a finding that there has been unprofessional conduct, then you get to know about prior discipline, but not prior complaints, only those that have resulted in discipline. So you will never know, as a hearing panel member, that the person has had 100 complaints, for example. You will not know that. You will know they had two prior orders against them. They, but you will only know that if you've already made a determination there was unprofessional conduct in this case, we're sitting with the health budget, now we need to reach a sanction, then those orders will be part of what you get to consider in your sanction determination. The, the only uh, exception is that you'll know that there's been a prior order when the allegation in the current case is violation of a prior order. And then the fact that there being an order, and let's say they were ordered, they were restricted from prescribing controlled substances. They did it anyway. So you will get that order said as part of the evidence in our case to prove that allegation, the violation of 181318 sub 9, violation of the commission order, you will get that order as part of the evidence in the case in chief, and it'll be spelled right out in the statement of charges. So um, that's the time we will know about prior discipline. How that health law judge redact an order everything except that part they were ordered to have done that they violated. Um, so you didn't get to know much. Um, it just depends. Um, and we might say more about that on the next slide. But um, that's a follow up question about that. It's more detailed, so I'll wait and see if there's okay. time at the end. Um, and you know, hearings are um, facilitated. A, a presiding officer, a full fledged judge, presides over the hearing just like any other trial. And you'll see rules on that, evidentiary objections. Um, and, and can ask questions themselves. And we'll take steps often to um, assure that witnesses and others are treated with dignity without interfering with people's ability to cross um, them. The health law judge will choose one of the panel members to serve as the chair. And that's the person that will sign any order that arises all from hearing. Um, the aging opposing counsel will present our cases. Um, it might involve Back witnesses, expert witnesses, or the combination witness that we had in a recent case, which is someone who is a doctor. They are testifying about facts. They are able to talk about medical opinions they had as a doctor in the case, but they won't be the one opining on, yeah, the other guy violated the standard of care. Our expert witness will handle that. Um, and the respondent themselves will testify. Once the person, the witness, is questioned on direct and then cross examination and redirect. Then we move to panel questions. Um, and so you, you do clean up <laughs> or ask um, anything that you thought should have been um, presented in the case. You get your opportunity to ask the question. You might not know uh, pre hearing rulings. 
um, where there was determination that certain things could not be asked about in the hearing. Um, a, a motion in limine was granted saying, we are not going to talk about thus and such at the hearing. And so it's nothing that you did wrong. You just don't know about those rulings. And so the, either one of the attorneys or the HLJ will say, we can't, we can't answer that question or we can't have that question in this hearing. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Um, so did you did you want to ask a follow-up question or I think I think we're more interested in hearing Judge Dixon than me. I am. Just that in hearing you'll often hear me say, I'll oh, you'll have a question. I could ask a bunch more, but we're running out of time and now there's probably no other questions than I have left. So I will turn it over to Judge Dixon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Roman Dixon. I am the Chief Health Law Judge for the Department. Um, and before I go too much farther, I'd like to just let you know how honored I am to be here today. I have a tremendous amount of respect for the work that you all do. Um, and I've been, I've been sure I'm truly impressed with all my interactions with uh, the Commission uh, throughout the time I've been in the Department. Um, so, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm originally from Washington, D.C. I made it all the I joke around and say that's the real Washington, but it's a move. So, originally from Washington, D.C., I was born and raised there. I came to the West Coast of the military uh, after short active duty time, about five years, and then nine years of National Guard time. Uh, I decided to leave Washington my home, so I stayed here. I had no uh, all of my legal experience has been here in Washington. Um, so, uh, uh, when I started my career, I was a mystery prosecutor, so I did criminal prosecution. Um, probably not at the level that was going on here, but uh, definitely uh, the quantity was there. Uh, so, uh, I spent some time with the Senate. Uh, I sat in so I worked in uh, civil practice and primarily toxic tort. Um, and I joined the department in 2011 as a staff attorney, where I had the pleasure of working with Kyle back then. Uh, Kyle was one of the people that were in the department back then. Um, 2012, I came to over to be the health law judge and was honored to be chosen to be the chief in 2016. So I've been the chief judge since then. Thank you. Um, so, which one do we want to go with first? Uh, we can go with this piece of notes. I understand that uh, the, some of the commissioners are interested in a few cases that are completely done now. Um, with that, I'll give you my brief disclaimer in that I think I only had direct, well, I had direct involvement in two of them in various stages. So, I will do my best to answer any questions that you have pertaining to. Uh, Definitely the work that I did on those cases. Um, and I'll do my best to uh, just based on what I do about the procedural history of some of the other ones to answer some of the questions if you have some related to something that some another judge did. Um, but um, I could be able to do some notes, so we can give some thought to um, and it's not, I guess, not necessarily limited to those questions, but give some particular ones. I'd be happy to try to dive in. Uh, dismantle what may seem really confusing. Uh, so um, some of my do's and don'ts are going to echo what uh, Mr. Ruby Bond said, simply because um, I think they, they bear repeating uh, and, um, and you know, so there's going to be some overlap. What I'll say is I'll start with saying uh, disclosing potential conflicts and unavailability early. And that's because so many conflicts that you may have or you think anything that may not um, conflicts with your schedule or what you don't know, what you don't know if you can make it to be a panel member. Um, as they both said, um, rescheduling a hearing is um, very disruptive, as you all know. It's disruptive to your colleagues who, who can make the hearing, but it's also disruptive because it involves a tremendous amount of scheduling coordination. 
not just um, head of them, but the attorneys have the ability. Um, one, one thing I can tell you about is Bob and his group, you know, there are a lot of cases. Um, and so they have to move the ball. Um, as you know, uh, you all are very busy, uh, both in the private labs and in the professional labs. Um, experts, um, other witnesses, the judge. So it's a lot of coordination that has to happen. And so it's really disruptive and it can result in a case that um, you all, with a very serious case, getting delayed again and getting pushed down the road. Uh, we call it kicking the can down the road, but that kicking the can down the road can have serious consequences if a person steps out in their practice um, and presenting some type of mitigated changes in the company. So that's, that's one thing I'll say. Um, do your best to review my uh, exhibits and sign in early to the court. Um, this allows you to make sure that you're linked to this. Um, and uh, Madam Commissioner may even ask the question earlier, you know, we get these things one or two days before. Um, they did an expert job explaining that sometimes that's just the logistics of how litigation works. Um, they, uh, one of the, uh, they usually the respondents, uh, but sometimes uh, some redactions slip through from the AG's office or something like that. Oh, just not all the documents make it to the judge in the time that the, the judge was shooting for, and so had to send them back and ask for revisions or something like that. Uh, sometimes an issue was uh, the judge was sort of ruling on an issue until so the judge received more information. So all those things can impact when the judge actually gets all the documents where they are sufficient to send uh, to the commission. Uh, right now we have to work around uh, as far as how we get the documents to you all, but it's been working. And so um, in, other, in other situations, the judge sends those documents directly to the panel. But logistically, there's you know there's logistic uh, hurdles uh, with with uh, the medical commission where we we're still working on that. But the workaround. So I apologize. I will. Um, the expectation that I have on the judges is that they get the materials out one to two weeks, two weeks if possible. Um, that they get the links out early. Um, that's something that they can do. The uh, the teams link if it's a virtual hearing. Uh, getting those links to you all so that you can, it's not a lot you can do with it, but you have it. And so you don't have this one last thing to stress about. Um, as far as the documents, um, my expectation is to get it out as soon as possible. Uh, they're definitely one to two weeks, sometimes it's a few days. Um, and uh, as we were alluded to, um, years, uh, some of you have been around all the years past. Um, they had to compile exhibit notebooks, and sometimes they were these huge three ring binders, sometimes multiple binders that um, they presented to the judge to uh, for final review the morning of hearing. That's just, that's just their exhibits. The respondent had their side of uh, their selection of exhibit binders as well. They were provided to you the morning of hearing when you got the hearing. And you had to do your best job to synthesize all of that information to be able to uh, understand, hone in on the issues. And you all did a great job. Of. We had this one advance, one uh, thing that came out of the uh, pandemic and forced us to do things virtually and make these, utilize this technology that's out there. I think uh, we've seen a real benefit because you do get it um, sometimes a few days. On, in worst case, you get it the morning of, but that's certainly not the goal. And I, I'm always checking for feedback to make sure that I, I can work with the judges if that is happening, if it's happening with any kind of consistency, I want to know so that I can work with them and make sure that they are doing it they can. But I can say that it does happen. So I apologize for the inconvenience. Just know that we, we're aware of it and we know that it's, it's better for you to get the documents farther in advance and have time to review them at your own. Uh, and the internal means so that you're prepared to go. Um, another thing I'll say is embrace your role as an expert, uh, fact finder, and ask questions of the witnesses. Um, but um, a caveat there is use care to answer the questions. Um, it puts the prosecutors in a really difficult position if, let's say, I ask a question or one of the uh, one of the panel members asked a question that is 
to say out of bounds, but something that, well, there are restricted areas that we probably never have reason to go into, someone's sexual orientation, their, their, their gender, uh, sexual um, um, ethnicity, those things like that, um, rarely ever have relevance to these. Um, so uh, if you happen to ask one of those questions, uh, it puts them in a really difficult position because the proper thing to do is to object and not force the witness to answer that question. But it puts them in sort of, you know, they don't want to be at odds with the fact finder and, um, <laughs> or the judge. And so, uh, and so anyway, um, I would say just uh, use care not to stray into the lane of either the attorneys uh, or the judge. Uh, but certainly, you want to ask questions and embrace your role because occasionally, hearings that I've done, uh, one of the, uh, as, um, as I think Obama said, it really, it, sometimes it's something that they haven't thought about. It's definitely, it's, none of the judges are medical professionals, so it's going to be well out of their, uh, not in their So uh, you can sometimes eliminate an issue that otherwise might have not have been, uh, might have been like challenged. So definitely embrace your role. And like I said, one of the worst things is when you get sick with liberations. And you don't know the answer to a question because it wasn't answered. It's one of those pivotal pieces that you said, if I knew this, if I had asked about this, the existence of this. Um, but just know, uh, with that, just know sometimes, as they said, some of the information uh, has already been moved. And so uh, you won't be able to do it. But I can tell you, they work really hard to get everything that you're going to possibly can get fit into. Uh, but the judge has to make a determination. And they are always free. And so sometimes the judge is a piece of information or a piece of evidence that they believe you all would have loved to have had, but the judge deems that it would be recognition um, if you were to engage. Um, and like the commissioner had a question, asked about receiving prior complaints, unruly complaints, and things like that, just knowing that someone's been accused of something. The difficulty with getting through that information is because it's um, the danger is that it's going to be uh, unduly prejudicial to the accused. So now you're thinking, we're, you know, we're, we're all human. And so the belief is that um, the same where this smoke is fire. People believe that. And so therefore, you may, you may tend to want to put a little more weight on the fact that they were accused. So therefore, there must be something. And so because we can't, we can't uh, manage that appropriately. And as, as humans, it's difficult, it's difficult to come to the um, we sometimes we require that uh, one will want um, if a person has been, um, if, if hasn't been, uh, I guess, a fight that's made to a fight of war or something like that, that it's just an accusation. Um, and I think if we really look at it, um, we will want the same. We will, if, if it were you defending your livelihood and your potential, you will want to know that you want to be judged on. And so that information won't get, and the sequence of receiving like actual prior orders, you get that at the end for the very same reason that if you got it before you made your finding of whether or not there was misconduct, the the respondent could argue that hey, the only reason the evidence was weak in, in my current case, but they they found that I committed the violation because they knew that I had a prior foundation against me. And it's um, certainly um, all the participants, at least the, uh, the ones that are thinking about the safety of uh, Washington citizens, once you have all the information, you can get a decision to Washington citizens. Uh, but um, everyone also wants to make sure that the respondent receives a fair hearing because it's just not uh, a day or four days out of their lives. Most in most cases, it's the most important thing going on in their lives and possibly their careers. So we want to ensure that they receive. Everyone receives their pay. They receive their pay. So I might eat the uh, horse with that one. I will die. Oh, question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I, I was wondering, how does that approach square with the statute that says the commissioner, when they're considering the claim, and I'm assuming that turns into a case, has to consider prior complaints? 
when they're considering a complaint. Yeah, so, so their statute says they have to consider the complaint history. So they do consider it when they're deciding what to do with the case. And then the statute, I think what you're thinking of is a statute that says that before determining, before a final determination is made, they have to, and that's the sanctions part. So that it, it, it's, you, you, the charging panel can have all of it because you're making the decision about whether to go forward. And you want to know, I mean, a borderline case, if it's a first complaint, you might not want to charge it, but a borderline case, and there's been 16 prior complaints of a similar nature, you might say, you know what, it's time to charge. Um, but like the judge was saying, that's not necessarily what happens at a hearing. But if you get to the point where you think that, you know, they have committed unprofessional conduct and you're looking at what the appropriate sanction is, that's when you want to know, well, you know what, we sent them to accident before and then they kept doing it or, you know, whatever. Or last time we didn't get any kind of evaluation, we better do that this time, you know, that kind of stuff. Was that sufficient? Yeah. Yeah, so it's really about sequencing and the time in which you get the documents. Um, and as far as the, uh, again, as far as the accusation goes, um, that's the actual uh, requirements. Uh, so uh, this goes uh, also to um, informing the judge uh, to the desired outcomes. Informing the judge of any issues that affect their ability to prepare. Or to observe the hearing testimony. Um, it's good man with everything. And so with, uh, we've had some challenges with teams. I'll be the first to admit that um, I have fought the battle uh, for the first year or so with teams. I wanted to use Zoom, but Zoom wasn't the chosen technology, uh, technology solution for the department and the department of health uh, for our virtual proceedings. And so I made a special exception that. Um, so I, I, uh, I didn't want to die, you know. So we <laughs> moved on and tried to make it possible. And I think we've done a decent job, uh, a pretty good job. Um, the compromise that I've struck uh, with the uh, misunderstanding in my office is that if the um, there's a case that presents special facts or presents uh, what you believe to be tons of witnesses, tons of exhibits, or this is a, this is a nightmare that we turn that over. Uh, and I want to write as a judge to use the court for uh, And it's really just, uh, I don't think I've denied anyone's request. I let them use the court for it because that's what it takes on the stress. Um, definitely on the parties, on the parties knowing that there's just someone with attention to it still. Um, what I hear on recent is that's not flawless. Uh, so, but we do the best we can. And we work with them. How are we doing on time? How are we doing? I'll try to speed up. So, so yeah, definitely. Like, uh, so, by chance, you got you getting knocked out of the hearing or something like that, or you can't hear because you definitely want you want to hear. Why don't you take all of the information and so uh, you're in the best position in the hearing to uh, make the most appropriate judgment and engage with your colleagues in the deliberation. Avoid fraternizing or appearing overly friendly with the parties. Um, this can be a tough one because um, doing your work, you with your mission, you may get to know um, this problem is for personally. Um, you may even get to know me and one of the judges. You may have seen us a couple times and uh, presiding over the hearings that you had. And so there's a tendency to, you know, to be kind of this one. But what I always try to get people to think about is the person on the other side of the table who's observing uh, and they feel excluded. And they feel that, okay, this is, I knew it. This is, um, this is a kangaroo core. This is inside, inside baseball. Um, and so, um, and so we, you, a lot of what we do during the hearing is uh, insulating ourselves against the and so when we do things like we're overly friendly or, um, or we're, uh, and I'm, I'm not talking about just, uh, you obviously want to avoid what we call ex parte contact. That's essentially what most ladies speak is contact with one party to the exclusion of them. And so you're uh, conferring with uh, uh, 
Miss Bob, she could, but uh, <laughs> I remember you trying to talk to her doing a break. Like, hey, they don't know that um, you're talking about the parking situation. Um, they believe, you know, someone who's desperate or someone who is fighting for their livelihood may think that you're talking about the other things. So I just uh, encourage you uh, cautiously to and just really emphasize that you don't. Uh, you can be your best to uh, to that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, sometimes, as you said, I'm always friendly. Sometimes I always still don't know what to do. You know, sometimes we have a student, a family, we have someone lost, their kids or whatever, and then we have uh, from both sides, you know, the same family members. And I, I sometimes I just felt I want to express my condolences. I feel sorry for the family. But they can be on both sides, you know, both sides. I think sometimes we need to treat it being as over friendly or is that burning this type of thing at all? I think that's fine. I, I know it happened in a recent hearing, and I think you know, expressing no, especially when it's on the record and somebody's just testified. And I know a lot of commissioners said I'm very sorry for your loss and you know that kind of thing. I don't think that's ex parte, I don't think that's inappropriate. I, I think what, what Judge Dixon's more talking about is you know, we take a break and you know, let's say we were in person, you know, instead of virtual, and we're we're both heading to the ladies' room at the same time. I might stop and wait and let you go, and then I'll go after just so that it doesn't look like we went to the bathroom together to chit chat. You know, that kind of thing. Yes, the appearance of fairness is what we're really worried about. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Uh, I think possible conduct a deliberations meeting. Um, now, I know this is a tricky one because sometimes um, just being in the hearing all day, I know I, I call it being on. You have to be on the entire time, uh, focused a lot, and you're listening to everything. Um, and it's exhausting. You're not physically lifting anything, but just sitting there and being locked in is exhausting, whether you're personal or not. Uh, so, so, at the end of the hearing, especially one like, let's say, a four and a half day hearing. Uh, <laughs> You don't want to sit down and then discuss. You just say, you know what, I need some separation from this so I can get, uh, and let's come back and do it. Um, and so let's come back and do it or something like that. I encourage, um, and the, the judge is going to do whatever you all want to do. Your will, you guys should be willing to execute. Um, so that means that you're going to hear until 7 o'clock. If you want to deliberate for an hour, so you can get it done, the judge should give you any perspective. Um, but I always encourage parties that if, if because uh, we, we have something in the law, we say that uh, members speak. And you want to conduct your deliberations when your impressions of the testimony uh, and the witnesses is most fresh. That's going to give you, that's going to put you in the best position to, uh, you know, to uh, make the, uh, to have a, a ruling that's consistent with what you with your observation. Uh, so if you can do it, uh, it maybe not directly afterward, but soon there. So I would always discourage uh, parties. I, I, I routinely deny it when a party wants to uh, uh, bifurcate what we call separate the hearing from closing arguments and then from deliberations or something like that. Um, mainly because uh, it's one is disruptive. And uh, yeah. um, because it can be disrupted, and uh, so that's so this one thing to keep in mind. Um, sometimes you're a power group, sometimes you don't, and it's good to use it for it, but sometimes um, it's probably it may be in your best interest. Nobody wants to come back to this. If you have a difficult area, you don't want to come back to it anymore. I promise you, you're not going to want to do it. It's going to be just as much mature. Uh, two weeks from now, as it is today. So, it's something to think about. Um, just a few other quick things. Don't expect you guys to tell you what you're doing with deliberations. I want you to think about deliberations and hearing. Um, think about yourselves as the party. The judge is air traffic control. So, we're directing you, controlling the sequence of things. You're the pilot, determine. The judge is going to help you get into the air and you're flying the plane. You're responsible. Um, the judge, um, so the judge isn't going to tell you what they think about the evidence. So they should. Uh, they're not going to tell you what they think about the evidence. They would be out with this. Um, the judge may uh, 
uh, if, if you have questions about something. So I just made uh, a decision in that for individuals of resource as opposed to uh, our participants. Uh, when the judge reaches out to you, review and sign the order. Uh, really take the time to review the order. Sometimes errors can be caught at an early at that stage of review. Uh, I make those errors. Uh, I'm human, just like everyone else. Um, very difficult, very more tricky when you're trying to synthesize all the information and the will of the panel. Uh, sometimes you invert something. You call it this hospital as opposed to that hospital. Or this person's name is equal to that one. That really uh, it can create an issue for for reconsideration. And sometimes you can find it by just a little more just not rubber stamping the review. Say, okay, let me look at this. And if it doesn't die with what you recall from your uh, your recollection of the testimony and the hearing, that you can make a finding that uh, 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 that it wasn't the and the judge. Inadvertently said it was committed, you know, with sanction is something you want to bring to the judge's attention. And as that judge, uh, you know, you say, hey, I got a question. Uh, and the judge will be willing to chat with you about it to And then, this is where we on appeal, they come up with the commission of this night for. There's nothing particular is there. You see something that says something or has something to do with the mistake of the number that it's not with me. <laughs> so an appeal is not that. The appeal is them saying we disagree with what the commission's order is. And I will tell you that's our office defends the order. So we want you to get it right, probably more than anybody, because it's work on us every time we have to defend your orders. Um, I think what you're thinking about is can somebody come after and potentially sue you? And, and yes, they can, but you are insulated extremely well. You will be defended by the AG's office, not by us, by our torts division. You have immunity as a commissioner. They're not going to get to anything. So uh, anybody who's tried has failed miserably, just so you know. But it doesn't mean they won't try. <laughs> so. Yes. so I had a question on. Um, I've taken notes while reviewing the exhibits and then during the hearing. What's best practices to do with my notes? Do I strike them at home? Do I hold on to them until things are final? Great question. Um, when we were, so I'll just give you two, I like to do it. So before, when we were in person, uh, we collected your notes at the beginning of the hearing operations. Um, looking at it now, I don't know if that was practically the right thing to do because sometimes uh, you might need to refer back to those notes. If I just as you review the uh, final order that the judge sends you, you don't have any notes because you've destroyed them already. Um, so, what I tell the judge to do is to, uh, and I'll let Mr. Thomas follow this for uh, answer what you should do. I tell the judges to hang on to their notes until we get past the end of the hearing. Um, the issue, the, the problem is. Well, with your notes, uh, the delivery process should be protected, but there is, uh, so the danger of a judge keeping some information much longer than they should is that someone can come by a year or so later and you know, about it with a request, and it may or may not get protected. And so I always caution folks about the notes that they uh, write in the margins of, you know, if you're, if you're like someone's tie or something like that, it's probably not smart to write that. I can't promise you that we disclose. But um, I think they did use to collect them after. I think it makes sense to collect them again, but after the review of the order, because I think you're right. A commission member who's asked to review the order might want to go back and compare the notes they have. But I don't think we should collect them. And I don't mean BDHG, I don't have collector notes, so I don't the commission. Um, just if you're used to that or eight, ten words. Well, it's just more that it's really hard to answer because we have the Public Records Act that makes us keep everything um, in case somebody make, makes a public records request, but we have certain things that really are not supposed to keep. You know, that's that's the kind of thing that you really, you know, it's transitory. Yeah. So it, it becomes very difficult for us to answer that. Uh, 
just in the life of a case, so once you guys sign the order, you know, let's say you're the um, presiding the panel chair. Um, so I think that what Judge Dix is saying is absolutely correct. If you hang on to your notes until he sends you the order, you make sure it matches what you thought and you know, and then sign. Um, then the need for you to need those notes after that is extremely low. Uh, the one thing that could happen, and even then I don't think that you probably need those notes, but what could happen is it goes up on appeal and the Superior Court judge or the Court of Appeal says, you know what, the commission didn't do a very good job of explaining why they like this expert over this expert. We're going to remand the case back down for them to make additional findings. And then when it comes back down, we always go, what, what are we doing with this, you know? Because half the time, half the commissioners are gone now, you know, because it's been two years. But if the same commissioners are available, I would think they would try to pull the same commissioners back and have them do that. Do you need your notes for that? Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Melanie, you did an ethics thing before you have any <laughs> thoughts? I don't think, well, now it's all virtual. So their notes are at home. I'm not having them send them to us and collect. So don't even think about that. <laughs> um, I would say after the you're not even your notes you're not going to remember what you said because it's going to be a chicken scratch so i would say after the review of the order shred the notes and then move on that's what i would do so I thought if we were to say if someone's not recently but they're investigating the truth and the bias discrimination, which is difficult to find at this time on the record. So um, the bit of my contact attorneys is to try to like look at what the patients say. So like if they say I felt discriminated against because of my skin color or my ethnicity or my ethnicity, then that serves as good evidence for that is but um, so I guess my question is standard of care things seem pretty easy to me. The bias and discrimination evaluation or investigation is a lot more amorphous, and I feel like what I hear is um, no, this isn't really going to stand up. The AGs are not multi sign because you can't prove any, right? Because it's he said, she said, and yet for me. This is like a really important, huge area where um, I'm afraid of the medical let's just call it out. And I represent a lot of like the LGBTQ community. Um, it's a big deal and it's a big part of harm to get some patients that I feel pretty passionate about, but I don't really know how to, we're trying to figure out how to investigate more and get some best practices and stuff. But from a legal standpoint and like part of the action and not that kind of thing, I don't know how much experience. So I don't think we, I personally haven't seen any of those, but what you struck a chord with both Chris and I when you said that, that you hear that he said, she said, and so we can't do anything. That is absolutely false. Uh, most of my sexual misconduct cases are he said, she said, and um, they're that way in the criminal world too. You know, that's not, you don't usually have witnesses to that kind of stuff. So for me, it's a matter of who you believe. And so I would look for the addition of reliability that come along with it. You know, if the patient said, if this made you feel this way, you know, well, what did you do? You know, well, when I left, I was crying. I called my husband, you know, check with my husband. Did she call him crying? What did she say at the time? You know, I would look for things that that make you believe, you know, that either make you believe or disbelieve whatever the person is saying to you. And looking for other, you know, other Victims. I mean, that's what happens a lot of the time in sexual misconduct cases is we have one complaint and we charge it and it gets out of the media and all of a sudden four more victims come forward because everybody thinks it's they're the only one or they think no one will believe me because it's just my word against theirs. Well, all of a sudden it's he said, they said, <laughs> not she said. So anyway, but even one person is enough to get to put um, you know, clear code and convincing evidence because it's enough to get to beyond a reasonable doubt, which is even a higher standard in the criminal world. So there is no requirement that there has to be something more than that. But you are looking for the basis of, well, why did you feel that way? Because sometimes somebody felt that way without more than 
right? And so are we really gonna, do we really have enough to bring that case? Um, it doesn't really do anyone any good to take a case to hearing and lose, and, and lose for that complainant, you know? If I were to give one other advice for patient, I'm like, going to hearing is not for the future. They might be in um, So don't, don't just go, well, we're not going to settle because they need to go to hearing. Like, that's going to be a really harsh thing against them. It might, it might not. What are we maybe able to get in settlement? Because settlement is something you actually have. Going to hearing and losing sometimes even bolder these people, you know. So there's there's no bright line. It's a lot of judgment calls, and that's what your staff attorneys and um, sometimes they'll ask us to get reassigned because the case we're all wondering do we have enough? Where is that line? So we'll get more of us together to try to brainstorm it. But they're not bright line as sometimes. Well, I, yeah, I mean, we we keep dancing around and coming back to that one issue uh, about evidence. And um, the reason why, uh, in the legal world, we call it propensity evidence. Just because somebody stole a candy bar when he was seven doesn't mean that he stole the Porsche when he was forty-two. Um, it it just it's unfairly prejudicial, and that's important. Unfairly prejudicial is one thing, but all that. This is prejudicial. It, and that's why I, I think, especially with some of the sexual cases, and I hope this might be unsettled law or there's a route for a challenge. Um, sometimes the prior complaints have such particularities in them that it, the particularities go to show that it's unlikely that the first two or three people who are seeing something so weird or so particular and, and while we call that modus operandi um, it is a, an avenue that you can get things in but in addition to that i think especially with sexual molestation especially where we see sexual predation um i i don't know that propensity evidence is necessarily unfairly prejudicial so i would wonder if there is a route to um, challenge that or to make the arguments on uh, modus operandi. Um, now, certainly, from the flip side, I mean, I, I would hate for people to bring accusations in. It, it opens a can of worms. I, I think that if you're going to bring in perhaps um, accusations, you need to bring that person in so that if you're going to line two or three or four people up, the defendant has or the respondent has the right to confront and explain away. But I, I think with sexual sexual crimes or sexual misconduct we're, we're talking about something where their propensity is is an issue well and what i to tell you that we have done on numerous occasions is if we feel like we don't have enough to go forward with that particular case what i frequently say is go ahead and close it but close it with a code that does not say like you know that did not happen you know something like that you know Close it with the code so if down the road another case comes up against this person, we can go back and look at it. And we have resurrected it. Um, one of the cases that was named up there is a case that we took and we actually pulled back a 10 year old case and right and recharged it because we closed it before we didn't have enough evidence, but when we had all these other ones, we decided to resurrect that one. So we do have that. So, but it, you know, what I don't want is a battle of like, well, you can't reopen it because they closure said you know there was no violation of whatever you know something like that so um, but if, if this can't have been tried there's no dismissal of prejudice and we have lumped those cases together for charging to try to bolster our case absolutely but we actually make it part of the yeah. and I simply add that I think Commissioner Rogers that therein lies the issue like you said well maybe you bring some of the prior Complainants or the prior accusers, then it then becomes a hearing when the hearing is about something other than the charge that the issue. You know what I'm saying? So um, uh, the judges want to entertain uh, any motion that's brought before them for, like you said, some of this. And you're right, the standard is uh, is it unfairly prejudicial? 